For many people in American cities, the most accessible path to economic opportunity is work in the building trades. But over the past 60 years, there has been a growing disconnect between those jobs and city neighborhoods, partly because of racial barriers. That's why the city adopted a resident job policy for major development projects in the 1980s. The policy has since been strengthened, but there still remain obstacles to inclusion. To bring us up to date, our guests from a group trying to expand inclusion, the co-founders of the Black Economic Justice Institute, Brother Lowe and Priscilla Flint Banks. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I want to start with Brother Lowell because some people might be thinking like now uh, with so many things being shut down or curtailed that maybe there isn't much happening in construction and maybe this is not the best time to talk about making construction jobs more inclusive. What, what, what would you say to that? Well, what I would say to that, Chris, is, you know, construction operates on a booming and bust economy. And right now, and for the last 10 years, Boston has been booming. And the fact that uh, contractors are continually getting work in this city, and, and when we say contractors, I'm also talking about the fact that a lot of out of compliance contractors who repeatedly continue to come in to the Boston community and get work. And, you know, the numbers are, have been dismal and continue to be dismal in terms of Boston residents getting employment on those, those, these particular sites. Priscilla, uh, remind our viewers, this, this uh, policy was strengthened just three years ago. So tell me, what were the target uh, percentages in this policy and, and how are we doing? So they were increased to 51% um, Boston residents, 40% people of color and 12% female. And they, um, the, the um, residents is horrible. The, 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 the numbers for the residents, some of these projects are at 20%, 25% Boston residents. They have a lot of people of color, but they bring people from out of the state. They bring people from, you know, we, we heard um, at, a, at a Boston Employment Commission meeting that they wanted to bring people from Georgia to do installation. So they their um, people of color numbers are a lot better. However, their female numbers are horrible as well. And because the unions are not very inclusive of females and, and, and people of color and some Boston residents, it's, it's very difficult. And, and, and it seems like business is back as usual. I mean, we ride up and down these streets and we see all this construction going on. And it's like the, you know, the, the pandemic never even happened. They, they did shut construction down for a while. However, it's, it's back again. And so the, 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 the new policy does not seem to be working either. Brother Lowe, one of the things that uh, we seem to keep hearing, at least from contractors or subcontractors, is that you know, no matter how many people there might be right now who are out of work and, and eager to get a job, uh, there aren't enough people who are job ready when it comes to the work in the building trades. Uh, is that true? Well, the, the fact is, uh, Chris, the, uh, the people who control the training happens to be the same people who should be employing people, the unions. And if the unions are not providing training, I mean, they know 10 years ago that there was a shortage in terms of minority representation. And, and if you're not training these people, you're not providing those opportunities for them to be trained, how are you going to build a workforce? Uh, Priscilla, what about just even keeping track of that? Because uh, one of the other things I'm seeing in between the two sides here is that there might be people who are uh, uh, trainable or close to job ready, but it, it's, it's not that easy yet to keep track of who they are and, and, and to get hold of them. Do we need a better system to track those people? We do need a system. Um, the, the, the city of Boston has what's called the Boston Job Banks, where a lot of people could go and apply for jobs and most people that go there are not union but they they've been having problems they just i believe recently hired somebody so especially if you're a non-union if you you know if you're not a union you're looking for work you could go and apply for a job through the boston job bank however that system doesn't work either there, there needs to be a way that we could 
find out who needs to work, who's looking for work, and who needs to be trained. That's, the training is so important. And, um, you know, there's a um, T. Michael Thomas from the People's Academy. He is finally getting ready to build his academy, which is great because he'll be able to train people. It's, it's the training that is what's really hurting our community. Right. And brother, um, what about uh, y y your own experience? Is there anything that you can point to about how people um, sort of get engaged into this pipeline and, and to opportunity? Yeah, well, I can speak off of my personal experience. I benefited because of the Boston uh, job ordinance and because the fact that they, I, I was, I'm a former power driver. So I got experience knowing what it's like to be uh, in the unions. But one of the problems, Chris, is the fact that even since way back when Joe Nigro was, uh, was around, I'm sure you may remember Joe Nigro. Yes, I do remember Joe Nigro. Yes, they, the unions were never willing to allow us to know how many people of color that were actually in the unions. You know, they, they, they never give us an accurate uh, track of how many people in the unions. And when you don't know who's on the bench and how many people are sitting around, it makes it difficult. And then you, there was a time, there was a moment when they were hiring uh, training, but a lot of those people had to continue to be sitting on the bench while people that was already in the union, their buddies and stuff got all the work, you know? So for sure, what, what, what does this mean? And is this mean that the, it's not that the unions don't have data, it's just that maybe they're, they're trying to protect jobs to That's people right. who were members already. Uh, I mean, there's a less polite word for that too. Mm -hmm. Right, right. They, the bottom line is they do not want to give us, they, they don't want to give out the information as to how many females are on the job, how many people of color they have, how many bosses, but they don't want to give that information. And it there seems to be no one that can make them do that. I mean, when the mayor ran for office, he said that he was going to bring the unions to the table for them to be more accountable. That never happened. Um, the state, you know, they're saying that because the unions are a private entity, no one can hold them accountable. But I mean, if you look at the job rate, if you look at the, 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 the what's going on in our community, especially in the black community, I mean, that, that's, that's a poor excuse. Brother Lowe, um, unions are private, uh, construction companies are private, but the money they get paid to put up buildings, where does that come from? You tell me, you know, I, you, I don't know, Chris, to be honest with you. I, I mean, it comes from us. <laughs> well, let's put yeah. it this way. Uh, they, they, they might get private money too, but doesn't mm -hmm. the city make zoning decisions that allow them to make even more money? And then you've got maybe hospitals and universities who are tax exempt. So, so yes. isn't there something about the taxpayers in Boston sort of subsidizing this development? Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's very true. And plus, even when it comes down to training, subsidizing training, there were federal dollars that goes into the unions that also provide for training of people in the community. And yet, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a big difference for people in our community. And I just want to say, like, uh, uh, as far as the colleges and the, and the hospitals, I mean, they have something called a pilot, payment in lieu of taxes, which they're supposed to give a certain percentage um, back to the city and and they they say it's voluntary so they you know they some of the colleges are given something but i mean just imagine if all the colleges i mean northeastern has taken over roxbury and, and, and mission hill um harvard has taken over austin bright and people being displaced and gentrified out because these colleges are continuing to build and they're not putting anything back they could even go into the into the school system and help and help the students i mean for for the boston to be the mecca of education and the boston school department to be where it's at it, it's sad and so there's there's a there's just right you know when you look at it it's racism across the board uh priscilla what, what are the things that we were reminded of in the in-depth coverage of this by wgbh with their investigative unit is that um, the city could sanction uh, some of these contractors, but at the same time, if, if you go too far in that direction, there could be a legal challenge that might overturn a lot of the gains you've had in the resident jobs policy. What do you think about that? 
Well, I say what, what they say is that they're afraid that these contractors and developers will sue. Well, I say let them sue, you know, let them sue. Because that, that's what they keep saying. Oh, well, they'll sue us and they'll get rid of the program. Well, the program ain't working anyway. So what difference does it make? It hasn't been working over the last 10, 20 years. So what do we have to lose if we go ahead and sue? We think that really this, we should have just go ahead and have a lawsuit against the city. Right. Well, when you say it's not working, um, how bad is it? Because, I mean, I'm, I've seen figures that you know, they're not nearly as good as they ought to be. But on the other hand, they might be better than they used to be, too. Well, um, I would say, Chris, that some contractors, because we monitor projects, because we attend the Boston Employment Commission meetings, then we have an opportunity to say, you know, we are what we are. They are trying. They say they're trying to, to do better. However, they can be sanctioned. And for some reason, that's what the city's afraid of. They will not sanction. The, these these developers and these contracts, and then you have repeat offenders. You have people that have since you know we've been monitoring projects that continue to do the same thing over and over, and all they get is a slap on the wrist. So they'll continue to do it, and so we feel like until you sanction some people, really you know put hit them in their pocket, um, then maybe the behavior will change because that's what needs to happen. The, the behavior needs to change. Well, hello. Uh, one last question here, because one of the things that, that we almost forget, because, because this has been part of the story for such a long time, the reason we have a job policy is because of grassroots action, grassroots pressure. Uh, what about the future? Well, I would hope that, Chris, that there's, there are a lot of in, uh, unions to this day that still have not really increased the minority participations. Now, if you could get some of those unions, for instance, the elevator operators, to increase the minority participation, that could make a big difference. And these are things that people could be trained to do. There's several unions, like you mentioned about, that are trying to do better, print, uh, the carpenters, uh, iron workers, these are, uh, you know, uh, unions that's in the community that's been trying to paint as union, but there are also there are also uh, uh, trades that still refuse to increase the numbers of of uh, minority participants on their on those projects. And if they themselves were able to take in three or four people and start training them from the community, I mean, it would make a bit of, a bit quite a bit of a difference. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank Chris. you, Chris. Thank you. There was Priscilla Flynn Banks and Brother Lowe from the Black Economic Justice Institute. We'll have more news in just a moment.